Yo, greetings, Earthlings. This is the Kabbalah episode. Actually, no, 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 scratch that, scratch that. We're going to rewind it. Hey, what? This is the Wisdom Traditions Volume 2. Yeah! Where we're going to talk about Kabbalah. Mama! So, yeah, like, I put a lot of thought into this. Like, which, do we want to do this in some... Actually, Nick inspired this. It was like, do we want to do this in a sort of chronological order? Do we want to, like, try to look back in history and discuss these groups as they popped up, you know, in their respective centuries in mm-hmm. order? And we were like, nah, let's just talk about which ones we find interesting. And honestly, dude, that uh, that's kind of, like, the only way it should be done, really, because you got to, you gotta like, go with what's pulling you. It's like, what what sounds, you know, because everything happens for a reason. We're well, being pulled in a certain direction. Yeah, speaking right. of getting pulled, can you, before we dive in, can you just explain this hat? I, I, really? I, I, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to. I, it's, it's what we talked about before yeah. we recorded the last one. Okay, um, then don't. I don't no, no, I, Y'all I just know. Did, I just wasn't informed. It, it's, it's just You're something. informed, you liar. It's, it's something I got at a Chinese flea market when I was in Florida, man. Like, and I thought it was cool. It it's, is because no, cool. I love it. It's a brimless hat, but it's kind of got like the Templar cross and it's got like the, the, the heat, bro. Here's the thing. It's got the heat. I'll be perfectly clear and concise and honest. The first <laughs> moment that I looked at it, I was like, yikes. And then very quickly after that, I was like, I was wrong. It actually goes hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing, man. You buy, you, you buy a funny hat because... The yikes is transformed into something much more profound. And and I will go one step further and say, oftentimes, uh, good fashion choices <coughs> are something that at first glance is like, what? But then the more you digest it, you're like, eh, that's pretty sick. Yeah, exactly, I dig it. Man. I dig it. I think you, you fly. Yeah, I wasn't even going to explain it, but that's okay. It's probably best that we did. Thanks, um, Alex. <sighs> so, yeah, it's like... I, I just love the idea of doing the Wisdom Tradition series because my goal here is to try to like illuminate the hidden spiritual undercurrent that has existed throughout history. You know, the idea is that there are these ancient secret traditions that have been connected, right? They all have basically the same or similar points of wisdom trying to explain how we relate to the divine. There's only one, there's only one source of reality there's only yeah there, there's only one god you know there's there, there's only one i mean people could say well hey that's disrespectful of what i believe i'm a wiccan or i'm a i'm i'm a, a classical egyptian commission or i'm still hellenized like we talked about in the last episode yeah uh, that's fine but you know those are those are all deities you, you know if you want to believe that that's cool but above them there's still only some there's one source yeah no th- that doesn't even it doesn't even invalidate those other religions at all it's just saying that like whatever the truth is it is all coming from the same one source right you know yeah, yeah. so it I, it's not even invalidating those other things i think like, pe- i think people get offended when you say there's one god like that sounds really right. christian right. well not really it's just objective right yeah we do, it doesn't mean there's one deity that, that is in control it, it's not like that it's like what whatever the source is it's all the same thing all these cultures they're all talking about the same thing it's just their own artistic creative interpretations and s- symbologies of that one source yeah I- exactly it's yeah so that that's that's what i want to cut to is like it's just it's interesting to talk about these different um traditions because you find as you dive into them that they have separated by some of them millennia um describe the higher spiritual reality in in a very similar way you know, and mm. that's that's where it gets fascinating. Mm-hmm. So, like, we started off with Essenes. That was really cool. And we had just been talking about it. And we were like, I th- you know, Kabbalah is the natural next place to go. Mm. So, Kabbalah is pretty wild. It's one of the first, uh, you could call it wisdom traditions. You could call it secret. I wouldn't call it a secret society. It's more like a body of knowledge. Like a secret right? practice? Or yeah, or yeah. Like it's, it's yeah. like a secret belief. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's not like... It's, it's not quite like, you know, Freemasonry or Rosicrucianism where it's like the belief is simultaneously in order. You know what yes, I mean? It's, it's right. a little different. It's, like you're not necessarily going to go out there and find very many like Kabbalah churches. Yet Kabbalah is used in these secret groups. 
Right. It's, it's, it's taught. It's, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, um, so it started popping up historically in the medieval period, like around the, I think like 1000, 1100, 1200, 1300, something like that. Let me find the name of the text here. What? That's when the first like evidence of, of like historical texts being found. Yes. Was around that time. Yeah. So it could be. And, and somewhere around 1000 to 1500, it starts popping up in uh, Spain, France, Italy, and Germany. And there's these texts that are coming out that the, I can find the official first text. It might even been the Zohar, but it basically, the texts were attributed to a writer who would have lived around the year 200. But mm. there's a catch there. There's there's no genuine proof or evidence that these texts were actually written in 200 because they started popping up. They started being mass, well, I say mass, you know, secret. They started being distributed in around 1,000. Right. And whoever authored this text, they're like, we're just transcribing the secret teachings of this dude from... 200 you mm -hmm. see what i'm saying so there's like there's an actual historical origin of these texts and then there's sort of like the claim that they're far older and then when you read some of these texts just like with the essenes and their bodies of knowledge you'll find certain little phrases where they're talking about reading ancient texts i found it it is the zohar the zohar okay. that's the foundational and it, yeah it looks <laughs> that's like the one i read by the way it was first publicized by moses de leon around 1240 who claimed it was a tanatic? Do you see that? Tan tanatic work. Here, let me see. A work recording the teachings of Simeon ben Yochai, which would have been written around the year 100. 100. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, it's a claim. But what we know is that it came from, you know, De Leon or whatever his name Moses is. Moses De Leon, yeah. Yeah, so that that's as old as we can historically date these texts. Right. Either way, bro, we're talking a thousand years. Oh, yeah. Crazy. We're not old. talking about some new age hippy dippy movie. No, 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 it's old. These texts are authentically dated to be bare minimum a thousand years old. Right. Right, that's my point. Yes. It's an ancient secret tradition. And what we know about Kabbalah and um, just like generally the tradition is it was like the fourth level of understanding for judaism so in in judaism you had four levels of understanding i actually had written down um these four levels because they're a bunch of terms that obviously i <laughs> i'm i'm not jewish right, you know, right, right. so, so it's sure? like because you are wearing a yarmulke uh, yes i am, right. I am. That, was, that was my secret point in wearing that on right, 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 right. but um, let me find this real quick the, the interpret it here we go okay so you have four levels of Torah knowledge, right? Torah meaning like the body of knowledge yeah. of Judaism, the text, the biblical texts, and so on. The Torah is the name of their book, yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, and the Talmud. Gotcha. And the Zohar. Right. So the first level is Peshat, which means the plain or literal meaning of the text. So that's like, bro, like, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but think of like your average basic believing religious person like a Christian who goes to church and they read the Bible and interpret it literally, literally and they think yes. that's all it is. Word for word, it's yes. literal, yes. That's level one. Right. That's level one understanding of the Torah. And mm -hmm. then you have level two, which is remez, which means the hint. This refers to the interpretations of the Torah that are not explicitly stated, but are rather only hinted at in the text contextually. Mm. Like, for example, there's a verse in the book of Genesis that describes Abraham sitting at the entrance of his tent when God appears to talk to him. And Abraham is sitting while God is standing, which this is a hint at the future, indicating that when a Jewish court decides halasha, I don't, obviously I'm going to butcher the the pronunciations here they're in god's presence and they must be seated while the almighty stands above them so it's like this little subtle context clues like that that only devouted seekers of the torah would okay. like catch up on sure. you know and then the third level is drosh which means homiletics an example of drosh is like the story of abraham discovering god at the age of three and having his faith tested by throwing into a fiery being thrown into a fiery furnace by king nimrod this story is not found in the Bible at all, but it's an integral part of the Torah. It's like a story that's passed down that's accepted as a part of the body of knowledge, but it's not written. 
You know what oh. I mean? Oh. So that could, like, a parallel to that could be, like, the stuff that is in the Dead Sea Scrolls that didn't make it into the Bible. Yes. Like, stuff that has been passed down orally or by tradition or whatever, but is not necessarily written mm-hmm. in the book. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. That's interesting. There's an entire book, uh, there's an entire literature of Drosh called Midrash. Some Midrashic texts are actually Kabbalistic texts too, which I didn't read those. I didn't cover those, but um, I I mainly covered the Zohar. Is there a lot? Is there like a ton of Midrash texts out there or is it kind of scarce? I'm I'm not 100% sure. I mainly focused on the Kabbalistic texts Mm -hmm. and there's quite a bit of that. I mean... It's not like, you know, it's not like the Bible or the Talmud that has like 50 or 60 plus books and a thousand pages. It's it's more like the Dead Sea Scrolls. Like there's a pretty decent finite number of these texts, but it's it's a big read. It's sizable. It's it's yeah. it's real. It's tangible. So that's interesting. Would would then like the entirety of the Kabbalah not be considered Midrash? Since? No, it's the fourth level. I'm going there. OK, it's the fourth level. Got it. OK. There's an, I was just saying, I'm picking up on what I was reading here. There's an entire literature of Drosh called Midrash, which contains many fantastical tales relating to the mm-hmm. Bible. The story of Abraham mentioned above is one. The story of Moses fleeing Egypt and becoming an African king years before he encountered God at the burning bush is another. The tricky element Whoa. is that the tales seem so simple and straightforward, but in truth they're not. Only an expert trained in the study of Midrash is able to understand their deeper meaning, and there's always a deeper meaning. It's a form Whoa. of allegory. This is important. I want to emphasize allegory here in this episode today uh, in a certain parts. But according to... Mm, I don't know how to read this. <laughs> my Monitas. I don't know. You're, you're the well, Greek oh, one. Oh, uh, yeah. My, my Monitas. What? My, my Monitas. Only a fool would confuse the tale with the message. The four... Okay. So you, you get what I'm saying? Yes. There, there's, there's, a, there's a message in allegory. Don't right. take it literally. Take the message. Yes. Right? Just like all the sages teach an allegory. In the New Testament, Jesus is teaching an allegory. There's, right. there's profound wisdom in allegory. Remember the Essenes. Oh, oh on, absolutely. Uh, of Wisdom Tradition Episode 1. They would get together on the uh, on the you know the seventh day or whatever, and they would have their sermons where they would teach an allegory. Yes. Emphasis on allegory for the Kabbalah thing. Yeah, and, and it seems like there's a through line with allegory. I mean, that's what theosophists believe. Exactly. There's a lot of these traditions that believe that like the most effective way yeah. to incept this information into the subconscious of whoever's reading it is through allegory. Exactly, because the higher realities are abstract. Yeah, yeah. You know, your so brain couldn't you, comprehend it anyway. Right. So it might as well try to convey the feelings to you rather than the literal like what happened. Right. Because the higher That's, realities are not literal. They're not they're not bound by a form. You know yeah, what I mean? They're they're formless. It's ineffable. Which is really cool because like the the subconscious like it it, it kind of behaves creatively. Right. It's like and, and so allegory is like almost like art. It's like it is like art. It, yeah, it's yeah. like poetry. It's poetry. That's so sick, dude. Like the most effective way to get it in somebody's brain is uh, to make it art, right? And then they'll get it, right? That's so sick. Yeah, I love. So that. emphasis on that because in in the book of Zohar, um, there, there's a part I I I'm gonna get to it in a little bit that that they actually in their ancient text describe how the wisdom was taught through allegory. Oh. So yeah, we're gonna get there. So then the fourth level. Of um, of Torah knowledge is sod, meaning secret. It's the esoteric dimension of the Torah that relates to the divine in the higher worlds. Gotcha. This is the realm of Kabbalah. Gotcha. This is the highest level initiates of Torah. You know, because again, we're focusing on Jewish literature today. We're focusing on, uh, you know, that that specific body of thinking. Yeah, you know, yeah. We're, 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 we're casting out other mystery schools for the time being. So the highest level of, of, of uh, Torah disciple or student or whatever, they are studying Kabbalah. It's the secret that the worthy were allowed to study. The elite, right? Whoa. Okay. I always... I, maybe I misunderstood. I always thought that like Kabbalah practice was kind of like an offshoot of Judaism that wasn't necessarily it seems like that at first recognized by all of Judaism but what that sounds like is all of Judaism if they recognize those four phases then the fourth one is Kabbalah so it's like 
I don't know. Maybe I was wrong in that assumption. To assume. I, I thought that too, and I'm I'm starting to think that maybe that's not the case. You know, like that's interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. Like, sure. Judaism is one of the most mysterious things in the whole world. It's complex. Honestly, it's very complex. Like, it's it's very complicated. I mean, the Talmud alone is like two thousand pages, or, or it's like it's like Jeez. twenty volumes. You know, like it's it's impossible to understand. I think. Um, anyway, so it's the esoteric dimension of the Torah that deals with matters of a higher world. It is concerned with the deepest questions regarding the creator, the universe, and the soul of man. It's this section of the Torah that is also known as Kabbalah, meaning the received tradition. That's also the literal, um, that's the literal translation into English of the word Kabbalah. It means to receive like, like, like a download. Yeah. Like, like the received tradition. Whoa. Right. Dude. Um, Word, it was never taught publicly, um, and there was it was only taught from master to disciple. Again, we're talking the middle evil, uh, the medieval ages, right? A, a thousand years ago, they're passing and, it down orally and yeah. Through and there was some point in history where it was only allowed to be taught to men who were like at least in their forties, because the Kabbalah was such a very. And you're going to see, we're going to read from some of it, and you're going to be like, damn, it, it's kind of like. Remember the Essene texts where where they're talking about stones and, and, and really like deep stuff and meditation and we're like, yeah. oh my God, this is 2,000 years ago how they know about this stuff. You know? Crystals and meditation yeah, and vibration the, and yeah. The Kabbalah texts are, are kind of like that and like it's it's definitely, um, it definitely stimulates the imagination. I, I, was, I was very inspired reading the book of Zohar yesterday, which means the book of radiance or the book of splendor. Whoa. It's, it's about the light. Oh yeah, I just, I just saw something and it was talking about like the light of God. Yeah, like the book of radiance. Yeah, the light of God. Yeah, uh, yeah. it says the Zohar contains discussions of the nature of God, the origin and structure of the universe, the nature of souls, redemption, the relationship of ego to darkness, and true self to the light of God. Yes, yes. That's and deep. I, I, I highlighted my favorite parts. Okay. So that's deep. It's crazy and like. I could see where back then people who had access to this text would be uh, controversial, you know, or like just the texts in general. Yeah. Especially during the times of like medieval Catholicism. It would sound like witchcraft. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And like there was an ancient legend that there were these four master rabbi in history. And one of them we covered in the Metatron episode, Rabbi Ben Akiva. Mm. He wrote the uh, the texts that we were reading from about Metatron, the Hecalot body of literature. I think it was Third Enoch. Um, those those mystical texts where they're talking about their celestial visions where Metatron was bringing them the information, right. remember? Right, yes. Um, that, that was purportedly written by Rabbi Ben Akiva. But the legend goes... Um, that there were four rabbinical sages in history who delved into the highest levels of Kabbalah. One of them died. He, he like, I think he killed himself. Whoa. One of them That's went, wild. went crazy. Oh. One of them um, lost his faith. And Rabbi Ben Akiva came back unscathed like enlightened like because the text was so high level that's just the legend that the right. text was so high level that it's like initiates be warned like you probably should only delve into this material if you're at least 40 years old you're mature you've lived a very long life and you've spent your entire life dedicated to studying the torah then you should proceed with caution into this body of literature today wow. reading this stuff would it have that effect probably not you know no we're talking about the medieval ages where they're sitting in and and little buildings made of like stone or whatever with candles at the, in the middle of the night and they're reading this shit. And you know, if they know their neighbor finds out they're reading it, they're probably going to be killed for heresy. Yeah. Like it's, it's a different world. Well, I also think there's something to be said about, you know, we talk all the time about how like the spiritual energy of the world must have been so much higher and more potent back then with all, like, right. you know, without all the distractions and stuff. So, I mean, yeah, they might have been reading it and like real actual spiritual things were happening with them and like they just couldn't handle it. Yeah, I think that's definitely possible. I found the part about the legend, by the way. So let's okay. get it right. So it is. Hold on. You're going to like this. Okay, so remember we talked about the four levels of Torah knowledge, the Peshat, the Rimez, Drosh, and Sod. Mm. They give rise to the acronym Pardes, which in Hebrew means an orchard. 
So the idea of like the highest level of Kabbalistic knowledge or like the perfected wisdom is like an apple orchard. Think think of like the apple of Eden. Eden. E- yeah, 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 the Garden Eden. of Eden. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So or like Elun from uh, Nor- Norse mythology. Same thing. Yeah, sure. Um, the orchard of the Torah is the, is one unity, and just as both the written and the oral Torah were given at Sinai, so too was the pardes, the meaning that this this wisdom of of the orchard, right? So the idea was that oh, there's actually a story in the Talmud that's a warning to the uninitiated, uninitiated against entering the deepest levels of the pardes, which is like the orchard of wisdom mm. from these bodies of knowledge. So the Talmud, which is like again, it's a it's a real it's not a secret text, you know. Um, it recounts how four squ- scholars, Rabbi Akiva ben Zoma ben Azai and Elisha ben Avuya, entered the part as meaning that together they delved into the most hidden secrets of the Torah. As a result, ben Azai lost his life, ben Zoma lost his mind, Elisha ben Ayuva, uh, Avuya lost his faith, and Rabbi Akiva emerged unscathed. So, yeah, so that, that, that's the point. There's all this mystique around Kabbalah and the medieval ages. So let's get into what some of the actual text is. So we have some Papa. Papa. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> my, my brain's going a mile a minute. Popular texts. Vision of the Chariot. Um, that, like, classical Ezekiel story. Mm-hmm. You know? Like yes. the vision of the wheel within the wheel. Oh, yes. That was regarded as like an esoteric Kabbalistic text as well. So like you have that in the Torah, you have it in the Bible, and then you have the Kabbalistic literature where they're studying it more deeply and they're like divulging what it actually means. Right, Right. because like it's so funny. Like you read the Bible and so much of it is just like seems straightforward, normal stuff. And then out of nowhere, there's like a burning wheel within a wheel in the sky. It's like, you know, it's like where did that come from? It's extremely high mystical stuff out of nowhere. So then those people obviously see that and they're like, mm, there's something we got to dig into. This. Exactly. Yeah. And then we also have the Hecalot body of knowledge, which is what we covered in the Metatron episode at, 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 at uh, not at length, but like, you know, kind of lightly, but it's the celestial chariots and visions. It was like, they were also known as the Merkaba mystics. Mm. Remember the Merkaba? Like this mm-hmm. is the Merkaba. Um, any of those bodies of knowledge or texts actually were Kabbalistic texts as well. So wow. they were esoteric. They're studying them, meditating on what, you know, these symbols mean. And they're trying to reach enlightened states to like see Merkaba and celestial right. visions yeah. and things. You know, you have. And for for uh, those who might not know Merkaba, you want to just real quick. Exp- they're like. Yeah. It, well, if you can see me, if you're watching, this is uh, the shape of the Merkaba. It's it's the Merkaba is like. I don't know how to describe it because it's a very abstract metaphysical thing, but it's the concept that like you have this archetypal spiritual dimension that is permeating everything. And like you have at the basic level, you know, we're all made up of like the union of masculine and feminine forces that are symbolized in the archetypal dimension as like the upward pointing, uh, pointing triangle and the downward pointing triangle right masculine you f- yeah you form them together and it makes the star the six pointed star which is a Merkaba. but then when you take that and you add another level of dimensional reality to it it becomes 3d it's the Merkaba. right the, the idea is that each one of us are represented in some metaphysical dimension by a Merkaba. like our soul is it's like our soul yeah like we're connected to it it's like the light body yeah you know? exactly like a i mean you've you've said in the past before that you could Think of the lights that you see in the sky as Merkaba. Yeah, it's like the soul. It's like it's like your soul, right? And 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 there's belief that the word Merkaba actually comes from three different words: Merkaba, which is like spirit, light, body. Like right, ka, like cause the Egyptian word for soul. Um, ba, I'm not sure which that means. And then Mer, one of the, it's like spirit, light, body. I could look that up, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Just we, for people who didn't know, I just wanted to give a quick little. That's what the Merkaba is. It's like a 3D six-pointed star that is used to represent like the light body of the of human consciousness or the soul. Right. The chariot derived from the Hebrew word chariot. And again, like this is an old concept. You see it a lot in New Age stuff, but it's it's really an ancient concept. Um, I was trying to find. I I always find it so fascinating, but I always forget where the word comes from. But it's really cool. 
it, it's it's something like spirit light body is yeah. what I think it translates to. Mm -hmm. But the mer and the ka and the ba are all different root root words from different languages. Gotcha. You know, I just I, I can't I can't remember. But um, we have the Sefer Yetzirah, which mm -hmm. I read that one many years ago. I did not read it for this episode today. But the Sefer Yetzirah is really cool. It's did like, you read that in school? No. I just, when I first ever learned about Kabbalah, I read it. Got it. Many years ago, like back when I lived in Fayetteville, mm. seven or eight years ago. Um, it's very cool. It's like the Kabbalistic creation myth. You know, mm, um, you have, it. I love a good creation myth. Oh yeah. And the, and the Zohar talks a little bit about that. We're going to get into that. And then the Sefer, the Sefer Habahir, which is like the more mystical teachings of the book of Genesis. Mm. So it's like a complete revisiting of Genesis entirely from a Kabbalistic. Oh, lens. that's so, so cool. So really cool. But there were way too many texts for me to read to like pull from them and, and streamline into one episode. So, you know, I focused on the Zohar and, um, yeah, so let's get into that. The cosmology of Kabbalah is pretty cool. It's the idea that there are 10 emanated realities, right? In total. And that includes the Ein Sof, which is like the highest, the highest uh, version of reality where the the source comes, and mm. the source is described as being like a ceaseless, limitless, lossless, endless fountain of of ocean or a, a fire that never is consumed but doesn't need to consume and can't be. It, it's described as this unlimited, ineffable, all powerful, all radiant, all shining. Endless, limitless force. It's like consciousness. Yeah. It's like the, the but, but, limitless body. But of, but it's like, it's not even just described as consciousness. It's described as like the source. Right, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's the source of consciousness. It's the I light. Mean. It's the true light. Yeah. It's, you know, it's it's described in terms that are deeply imaginative. It's like Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the source of all hearts. Well, remember in, um, remember in the Metatron episode, we talked about that book of... I can't remember the name of the text right now. It's, um, let me think about it. It's, it's, uh, damn. It's the one where it's like, they're trying to overwhelm the mind of the initiate. Oh, with, with uh, the, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't think I remember the name of it, but that was the one where they had all like the anagrams and the weird letter. Yes, like, like, yes, yeah. yes, yes. I'm trying to think of the freaking name of it. It wasn't, uh, was it the Sefer something? No, no, I can't, I can't, I'd have to go look at it later. Let me, well, you go ahead and talk. Let me see if I can find it. It might be in the episode description. Okay. If, if you go find the episode. Okay. Anyway, so yeah, the, the, the Kabbalistic texts are really cool because they use a lot of language that's intentionally trying to stimulate the imagination to reach new heights, to fathom the higher reality, right? Mm -hmm. So like, for example, I'm going to read some excerpts from the Zohar, which is the first ever foundational text of Kabbalah. It's the one that we were talking about that popped up at around 1000 AD and was uh, believed to be from... Uh, 100 AD. Right, yes. So let's talk about the first light. This is how... <laughs> this is pretty wild. Um, this is how the Zohar begins. You ready? Yes, I'm ready. Also, did, were you able to I find I couldn't find text? it, no. It's going to kill me if I don't find the name of that text. <laughs> I'm trying to find it. Yeah, I, I got to get out in front of it and just say it. When my brain starts thinking about um, these kinds of topics and things it starts going a mile a minute and i start crashing over myself you know mm. so it's like i i, I the, the the word is on the tip of my brain yeah i can't i can't you, you you wanted me to go to the um description of what the metatron episode yeah that text is yeah let me see it's 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 killing me i'm gonna find it it's okay if it's in the episode description i'm about to find it right now we can cut the silence if there's a little bit no it's okay i'm gonna keep going all right um this is how it begins, the Zohar, the Book of Radiance. In the beginning, and it's a quote of Genesis book 1, verse 1, it's important to note that because this was written after, you know, the Torah, or you could say the Old Testament in, in Christian terms, um, was written, they make a lot of official references to those texts. So it says, in the beginning, in quotes, Genesis 1, 1, when the will of the king began to take effect... He engraved signs into the heavenly sphere that surrounded him. 
Within the most hidden recess, a dark flame issued from the mystery of Einsof the Infinite. Like a fog forming in the unformed, enclosed in the ring of that sphere, neither white nor black, neither red nor green, of no color whatever. Only after this flame began to assume size and dimension did it produce radiant colors. From the innermost center of the flame sprang forth a well out of which colors issued and spread upon everything hidden, everything beneath, hidden in the mysterious hiddenness of Einsof. So Einsof is like the all. It's like Did it describe it as a flame? Oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go into that. Okay. So Einsof is the cup the official Kabbalah word for like what the Gnostics would call the Pleroma. Uh the 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 Kybalian would say the all, you know, the source, the highest God, whatever you want to conceive, the one above all, that's Einsof. Well, it's also crazy that it's described as a, a flame or a fire because that sounds like the Holy Spirit is, you know, is yeah. also described as a fire. That's that's interesting. So Einsof is regarded as the realm above all realms from which the lower realms are emanating from like layers, like discrete layers. And the terminology used is like, first you have the original layer and then a layer comes off of it Wearing the previous, um, we're talking about realities. We're yeah, talking right. about dimensions. Yeah. And then the next layer comes off and it's clothed in the previous layer. And then a new layer comes off and it's like, fra it's describing it as like fractal. It's describing as like the highest reality emanating the lower ones down to where we are here today. You know, so. And, all, and following this same thing, is that still referring to the 10 distinct realities or is it like more of like an infinite reality? All thing? 10 together is Ein Sof. Gotcha. Like the Ten Tails Beast. Yeah. You know what dude. I mean? Or, or like the Sephiroth, you know, the. Oh, we didn't even talk about that. So these, these realms in Kabbalah are known as the Sephiroth, which, you know, if you're gaming fans or whatever, you know, Sephiroth from Final Fantasy, that's obviously a reference to that. Um, Full Metal Alchemist, you know? Oh, yeah. In the first, in the first level, when, when they do the ritual to try to bring their mother back from the dead, yep. th they see a door, and it has the ten... It actually says the words, Sephiroth. Yeah. And it's, you know... It's, it's the tree of life, it's right? Kabbalah, yeah, it's the tree of life. Yeah. That's the thing. Is it's The dimensions are symbolized by the tree of life, and they're the ten Sephiroth. And the realms mean something. Like, the crown... I think the crown is... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher this. I think it's Chakma. Mm. Chakma. Let's look that up. And, and each of the Sephiroth have a different name that symbolize different layers of reality. And, um, you know, it reminds me a lot of Yggdrasil. Yeah, yeah. And, nine realms, right? And it's a tree. Exactly. Yeah, there's nine realms. I mean, sure, the Kabbalah, the Tree of Life is ten, but technically, like, the tenth is, like, the material world anyway. So the, it's basically talking about the same thing. Oh, I was wrong. Chakma is not the highest realm. The highest realm is Ein Sof. That Ch makes sense. Chakma is the Sephirothic crown. You have Kether, Bina, the Holy Spirit, Chakma. Okay, so you were saying in the crown, and it's in the crown. This is. I'm trying to get the image to pop up, but it's very blurry. But anyway, moving on. We can revisit the Tree of Life. So I'm going to keep reading a little bit on that text. So we left off at... From the innermost center of the flame sprang forth a well out of which colors issued and spread upon everything hidden, hidden in the mysterious hiddenness of Einsof. Notice they say hidden in the mysterious hiddenness. Yeah. There's a lot of redundant language to try to like make you fathom the unfathomable. The the point, you know, it's like they're using this allegorical word play to try to like hit imagery in your mind. It's like very really intentional. Really drive it home. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's actually a, a thing in here I highlighted that talks about like the power of allegory to fathom God, you know, um, the well broke through and yet did not break through the ether of the sphere. It could not be recognized at all until a hidden supernal point shone forth under the impact of the final breaking through this pri And then this is a footnote. This primordial point is identified by the Zohar with the wisdom of God, the Hokmah, the ideal thought of creation. The idea is that it's all thought forms being thought into reality by the highest layer, you know, beyond, Damn. Beyond this point, nothing can be known. Therefore, it is called Reshit, beginning the first word out of the ten, by we by means of which the universe has been created. The universe, this, I'm still reading the text. The yeah, universe, yeah. the shell, and the kernel. 
So the idea is that the universe is the shell and the kernel. Remember, we're talking about the layers of reality emanating. So when King Solomon penetrated into the depths of the nut garden, as it is written, I descended into the garden of nuts. He took up a nut and a shell and studying it, he saw an analogy in its layers with the spirits, which motivates the sensual desires of humans, as it is written. And the delights of the sons of men are for male and female demons, Ecclesiastes 2 and 8. You know, that's like the whole belief that the fallen angels and all that. Mm. The Holy One, be blessed. Anytime they ever mention the highest God or they, they, they call it the light, of the, pre, the light of the presence, the Holy One, the Ein Sof, anytime the Kabbalist mentions God or the highest realm, they always praise. They always say, mm. be blessed. <laughs> it's fine. They throw respect on the name. So they oh, say, that's like Islam. That's like, it's like, you know, like, yeah. uh, what is it? Muhammad, peace be upon him. That kind of thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's like respect. an honor. Like be yeah. blessed is God. You know, right. They yeah. always do that. I, th I find it interesting. That's cool. So it says the Holy one be blessed saw that it was necessary to put into the world all of these things. So as to make sure of permanence and of having, so to speak, a brain surrounded by numerous membranes. The whole, the whole world, upper and lower, is organized on this principle from the primary mystic center to the very outermost of all the layers. Primary mystic center. A thousand years ago, at least this was written. God. That, 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 that's important. You know what I mean? To, that, it, just, it sounds like something that you would hear written like by, by some new age thinker. In like the 1900s. Exactly. Like early theosophical stuff. Exactly. Yeah, this is this, this is, is a, minimum a thousand years old. And I was thinking about this earlier a little bit. Like, how how did you know if they didn't have the technology that we have and the scientific instruments to conduct all these studies and all this stuff? How do they know about energy and frequency and vibration? And if it wasn't via some sort of spiritual connection, right? There's you know, no I, other explanation. And but and yet these ancient like philosophers and like deep thinkers have known this for thousands of years. It's wild, huh? God. The whole world, the upper, the lower is organized on this principle from the primary mystic center to the very outermost of all the layers. All our coverings, the one to the other brain within brain, spirit inside of spirit, shell within shell. The primal center is the innermost light of a translucence Subtlety and purity beyond comprehension. That inner point extended becomes a palace, which acts as an enclosure for the center and is also of a radiance translucent beyond the power to know it. The palace vestment for the incognizable inner point, while it is an unknowable radiance in itself, is nevertheless of a, so, uh, a lesser subtlety and translucency than the primal point. The palace, it always has palace in quotes, the palace extends into a vestment for itself the primal light. From then outward, there is an extension upon extension, each constituting a vesture to the one before as a membrane to the brain. I looked up what vesture meant because I didn't know, and that meant clothes. So that's what, oh. I was, that's what I was trying to say to you. They're, they're describing that the original light, the original primal force of creation is thinking these layers into reality like a brain with all these membranes or like clothes, like vesture. Like the lower you go into the emanated worlds, it's just like... A shell to the higher worlds. Right. Okay. Yeah. The nut allegory thing it's makes fractal. sense now. It's like yeah. world within a world within a world. Exactly. Within a world. Yeah. And it's infinite down all the way up to the original supernal primal light. God. The Ein Sof. The original existence that, that we can't fathom because there's no form. There's no nut. There's no shell. It's just right. the origin of everything. Yeah. From then outward, there is extension upon extension, each constituting a vesture to the one before as a membrane to the brain. Through membrane first, each extension becomes brain to the next extension. Likewise, this is the fractal part. Likewise, does the process go on below? And after this design, mm. man in the world combines brain and membrane, body and spirit, Whoa. all to the more perfect ordering of the world. When the moon was conjoined with the sun, she was luminous. But when she went apart from the sun and was given governance of her own hosts, her status and her light were reduced, and shell after shell was fashioned for investing the brain, and all was for its good. So it's important to note, anytime they make mention of any of the three types of soul here, which that's interesting, they have different versions of the soul. Kind of like the astral body, the mental body, right. stuff, but they have different words for it. But anytime they reference the soul they say she 
Whoa. Always. Like in the text. It's the soul is she. The soul is actually likened to a godlike primordial mother. Important to note, bro. This Remember the Kabbalah. The, the, yes. Remember the Holy Spirit. We talked about that in the Metatron episode. It was believed to be a feminine word. And, uh, you know, obviously my dad had his encounter with the lady. She said, you know, I'm the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm the lady. Yeah. She didn't say I'm the lady, but right. you know what I mean? Anytime in this text they reference the soul or the great spirit, it's she. Dude, and it's talking about like the marriage of body and spirit. Like that's awakening. Yeah. Like, that's like this a thousand years ago. Also, also a lot of that sounded like Hindu. Like a lot of that sounds very Hindu as well. Like the whole like moon and the sun, yin and yeah. yang sort of thing. Like the and then, you know, when one was without the other, it was like chaos. It's like it's like very There's a lot of that in here. I skipped because the Zohar was it was decently long. I mean, it took me several hours to read it. Mm. Which, you know, for for like for example, if you pick up the Bible and you read like the book of Genesis or or really any book, the book of Numbers, the gospel of Matthew, it, it's not going to take you that long to read it. They're no. not very individually. They're not long texts. No, no. The Zohar took me three to four hours to read. Mm. It, it's big. Mm -hmm. It's pretty big. It's not a full book, but it's, it's freaking huge. Yeah. And there was a lot of text in here that I skipped because I was like, there's no way we can cover this all. And also I just found some stuff to be more interesting, but mm -hmm. there's entire sections devoted to like, you see here, it says male and female about those forces. Wow. It's it's they're explicitly talking about those forces being the creation of reality, the same with the body and the soul and how that's in all of us. I mean, it's it's pretty in depth. Damn, dude. Like for example, it's like how would the man who makes a journey and away from his wife ceases to be male and female? Such a one before starting and while he still is male and female must pray to God to draw unto himself the presence of his master. And it's just it's just stuff like that. It's talking about like transmuting both of those energies within you. Masculine and feminine. Right. 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 Yeah. Okay. So this is this is the first part of it that I read that I was like, holy shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it's talking about God in the concept of being the consuming fire. Which is very interesting because when you think about like first century Jews and even beyond that, what were they known for? Animal sacrifice. Mm. So you have to understand, you know, this is a culture of people who believed that any time they had to atone for their sins, they had to ritually sacrifice an actual animal. Yeah. So they had a lot of time under their belt, like slitting the throats of goats or sheep or lamb or whatever, and actually burning their fucking flesh on a fire. Mm -hmm. and they're sitting around and they're thinking about the deep meaning of this and what it means, right? I mean, this is just daily practice in their culture. And many cultures back then. So just keep that in mind. Rabbi, Sin this is in the text. Rabbi Simeon said, In one place it is written, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire. In Deuteronomy 4 24. And elsewhere. But ye that cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you this day. Deuteronomy 4 and 4. The companions have already discussed the seeming inconsistency between these texts, but I offer yet another interpretation. It has, been in it has been affirmed by the companions that there exists a sort of fire which is stronger than other fire, and the one consumes and annihilates the other. If we continue this thought, it can be said that he who cares to pierce into the mystery of the holy unity of God should consider the flame as it arises from a burning coal or candle. There must always be some material substance from which the flame thus rises, and the flame itself may be seen two lights, the one white and glowing, the other black or blue. Of the two, the white light is the higher and rises unwavering. Underneath it is the blue or black light upon which the other rests on a support. The two are conjoined, the white reposing upon the throne of the black. The blue or black base is likewise connected to something beneath it, which feeds it and makes it cling to the white light above. At times this blue or black light turns red, but the light above remains constantly white. This lower light, at times black, at times blue, at times red, serves to link the white light above it with the material substance below to which it is bound and through which it keeps kindled. This lower light is in its nature an instrument for destruction and death, devouring whatever comes near it. Mm. But the white light above neither consumes nor demolishes, nor does it ever change. Therefore, Moses said, For the Lord thy God, meaning you, talking to the people, 
For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, consuming actually all that is beneath him. For this reason he said, Thy God and not our God. And as much as Moses stood in the oh. supernal light, which does not consume and does not demolish. So again, Whoa. Moses is saying, thy God is a your, consuming fire. Your, your God, God is, is, is the, the cons- blue and the black light. Right. My God is the white light. Whoa. But it, it keeps going. Dude. That's like duality. Also, exactly. But also like, also think about how, you know, how many billions of people throughout history have read you know, for the Lord thy God is a consuming fire and thinks Moses is, you it's know, but then you read about, this ancient text and they're like, well, that's why he's talking about your God. Yeah. He's actually not claiming your God. You see what I'm saying? Like yeah. there's a different, there's a different lens through which they're explaining what this means. Yeah. Why would he say thy God? Yeah. But, but also we've never questioned that. Right. You know, yeah. that's the example of what's in, in Kabbalah. They, mm. they sit around and they're like, this is what this really means. This is what this really means. You know what I mean? So it says, and Moses stood in the supernal light, which does not consume and does not demolish. Remark further, it is Israel alone which impels the blue light to kindle and to link itself with the white light. Israel who cleaved to the blue light from below. And though it be in the nature of the blue or black light to destroy whatever it touches beneath, yet Israel cleaving to it from beneath are not destroyed. So it is said, but ye that cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you this day your God and not our God. That is to say, it is the blue or black flame consuming and annihilating whatever cleaves to it from below and still you cleave and are alive. Only just perceptible above the white light and encompassing it is yet another light. What? This one symbolizing the supreme essence. So does the aspiring flame symbolize the supernal mysteries of wisdom. So it's the concept that even when you see the flame, there's, there's a secret flame that is the real God, you know? Okay. That is, that's some Lord of the Rings shit because the, the exact same thing is in Lord of the Rings. There's basically Iluvatar, the like God over everything. He gives a secret fire to all of his like most loyal Maiar. Like you might remember this, but when Gandalf is on the bridge and he's about to fight the Balrog, he tells him the fires of Un. What does he say? Udun? No, 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 no. He says flame of Udun. Flame which of is, Udun. Yeah. Which is he's Balrog is the flame of Udun. Right. Udun is like a hellish like. This, realm. Oh, the the secret fire. I am a wielder like of the secret fire, the flame of Honor. Yeah, that's what he says. Yeah. I am a wielder of the secret fire. That's crazy, dude. Right. right? A secret fire. That's what he's talking about. It's it's a power that like Iluvatar God only gave to his most loyal like soldiers. Basically, I'm a wielder of the secret fire. That is but but crazy. that's also kind of deep because when you think about it, there's so much rich religious and even esoteric symbolism behind the flame. This little light of mine, mm-hmm. I'm gonna let Wait. it shine. Fi- flames, fire is light. Yeah, but but like. But there's, you know, sure, fire is light. It's also but, pure but, energy. Yeah, for sure. But it's like, you know, when we're looking at a flame, the Kabbalists are like, you know, you you guys get the exoteric part of the flame yeah. <laughs> that's consuming the flesh. It's consuming the wood. Right, right. But like we are observant of the secret part of the flame that doesn't consume. It mm-hmm. consumes the lower flame. Right. You know, the lower flame feeds it. The lower, the lower material substance is devoured by the lower flame, but the higher flame is free of all of it. It's just, it's deep. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. It's, it's so deep that, that hit me and I was like, damn, listen to this. So, uh, the four letters of the name of God, which is known as the tetragrammaton. There is a whole conspiracy theory. It's like a legend. It's like, you know, the philosopher's stone, the lost ark, the Holy Holy grail. Grail. There's all these legends throughout history. Are they real or not? Whatever. There's a legend about the tetragrammaton. And that's literally just the name of God. And there was a belief that even if you said it, you would die. You right. know, like if you notice when you read actual Jewish texts, when they write the word God, they just put G underscore D. Mm-hmm. They they don't say the vowels. Yeah. They're afraid to speak the name of God. Right. That's why there was the commandment. Never use the Lord's name in vain. They, they didn't think that you should ever just say the name God without some sort of purpose, period. That's why they're like the Holy One, blessed be he, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah. so the four letters, um, 
The four letters of the name of God represent the four stages of ever-increasing divine manifestation. A lot of so, fours. Yeah. A lot of fours. Yeah. Four corners, four cardinal directions. I mean, we're talking about like a material structure. The four, um, the four priests that tried to read the Kabbalah. The, yeah, or, or, or sages, and then there was the four understandings of the Torah that you were talking about. Right, like a right. lot of fours. I didn't think about that. So many the, fours. The, um, some of the seraphim have a like, numerology four guy. Faces. What's up with the fours? Law and order. Uh, oh, there you go. Okay, there you go. damn. I think a four is like material reality. Like you, you, you know, like yeah. Like I mean, you think about it. You live in a house. It's a, it's a square. You know, like ah, it's a box. The, the 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 real symbol of the philosopher's stone. There's there's a square in it. Yeah, you know? inside of they it. They say yeah. circle the square. You know, it's like I think I think of the square as symbolizing like material reality or material structure. Anyway, what do I well, know? That's just it. Structure. Yeah, structure. Order. Structure. Yeah. Law. In numerology, that are... in numerology, the number four is like work, stability. Yeah. Structure. It said like don't break the law on a four day ah. like you're more apt to get in order. trouble on a four day right yeah it, it, right. The, the order falls into place on a four day that kind of thing yeah give me one sec i have okay i have given the description i have given maybe take i'm just picking up after the 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 flame thing the description Oh, it said, when they had returned, Rabbi Simeon spoke. The description I have given may be taken as a symbol of the holy unity of God. In the holy name Yahweh, which is the tetragrammaton, is the four symbols. The second letter, He, is the blue or black light attached to the remaining letters, Yod, He, and Vav, which constitute the luminous white light. But there comes times when this blue light is not He, but Dalet, which is to say poverty. This means when Israel fell to cleave to it from beneath it and it fails therefore to burn and cleave to the white light the blue light is dalet if male and female are not together then he is erased but it's saying he as in the letter of the text right, right. with hebrew letters that it's not just like a b c they have like you know their, their letters are are words if that right, does yes. that make sense yes like um syllables kind of yeah it's like i, I can't stir, explain it but yeah. like they have a very intricate that's how Greek is too. Like le letters are like eta. Yes. Like, yes. That's yeah. a, like they're, oh, they're like, like, they're yeah. like words. Yeah. yeah. Um, if male and female are not together, then he is erased and there remains only Dalet poverty. But when the chain is perfect, the he, the letter of the tetragrammaton cleaves to the white light and Israel cleave to the he and give substance for us light and are not yet destroyed. And this, we see the mystery of the sacrifice the rising smoke kindles the blue light, which then it joins itself to the white light, whereupon the entire candle is wholly kindled alight with a single unified flame. Yeah, that's pretty crazy, thinking about, like, secret flames, you know, and, like, these allegories of the fire. I mean, that makes me think of Game of Thrones. That makes me think of, you know, any any sort of cool reference where you see these societies, like... Uh, like hoarding a secret knowledge? About a flame. You, right, the initiates of the flame, flame, you know things like that. It's oh, just, dude, Dark Souls. Yeah, that's exactly. what Dark Souls like, is all about. It comes the, from a real. Think about it, dude. That like the the whole like like lore of Dark Souls is like before the flame, everything was gray. There was no color. Baptized or, by fire. Right, there was no color or light the Holy to anything. Spirits and then of fire. the furtive pygmy found the flame and kept it secret and like all this stuff. That it's like, but even the pops up everywhere. Even the flame. They're they're saying though that like. Even the flame is not the essence. Mm -hmm. It's the secret light behind the flame. behind the flame. Yeah, which is deep. It's like, it's like the 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 author, or, or you could say the author of this text, or just the wisdom traditions in general, are trying to convey like, oh no no, no. you you're looking at the flame. I'm looking behind the flame. Right right. Oh right, you're right. you're looking behind the flame. I'm actually looking behind that. I'm looking even further yeah, back that's, behind that. That's what yeah. it always is. It's like the mystery is always more mysterious. You know, God yeah. is so ineffable. Yeah. Meaning we truly can't comprehend it. It's impossible. It's only we can only imagine. Yep. But that's all we can ever do is imagine God. That's why there's that Christian song, I can only imagine. Yeah, that's a good song, bro. You that's that? a, that's you a good ass that song. song? Oh, yeah. How could I not, <laughs> bro? That that's was a, a good deep cut. It is, that's but a deep but cut. also like, not really because that rocked our town. 
<laughs> Angel shaking his head yes. Everybody. <laughs> yeah, everybody everyone knew, that, knew song. that song. Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were singing it in church all the time. So we've got the three strands of spirit. And Noah begot three sons, Genesis 6 and 10. Rabbi Hia said to Rabbi Judah, about this text I will tell you what I have heard. This may be compared to a man who went into the recesses of a cave and two or three children emerged together. Widely diverse in character and comportment, one being virtuous, a second evil doing, a third ordinary. Likewise, there are three strands of spirit moving hither and thither, and they are drawn into three different worlds. Neshama, the super soul, or if you you know look at the, the, the footnote of it, it's the holy soul, the super soul, it's the deepest intuitive power which leads to the secrets of God in the universe. Neshama issues forth and goes into the mountain passages and there is joined by Ruah. Ring a oh, bell? Oh, Ruach. Yeah. Whoa. Right? Ring a bell? Mm-hmm. Goes into Ruah, That's or is joined crazy. by Ruah, the spirit. Then it descends below, and here Nefesh, the vital soul, joins Ruah, and the three are linked into a unity. So Nefesh... Trinity. Yeah, Trinity, right? The Trinity of souls. But the Nefesh is believed to be like, I have a soul, you have a soul, you have a soul, you have a soul. The Ruah is like, I guess like... It's the Holy Spirit. Uh-huh. It's it's like the it's like the force that's everywhere. That, and yeah, rather than a bunch of separate souls. That yeah, because that's the nefesh. Right. That all of our separate souls. Right. And then the ruah is like the force, and then the neshama. I'm I'm not quite sure. I mean, that's a new concept to me. It's like. It's like. I don't know. It's like the 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 super soul that, en- enlightens our intuition according to the words of it. Huh. It says the neshama is the holy soul or the super soul, the deepest intuitive power, which leads to the secrets of God in the universe. The super soul. But then ruah is the spirit. So maybe there's a layer behind that. I don't know. Dude, it's infinite layers. I know. The nut and the It's shell. never ending. Rabbi Judah says nefesh and ruah are conjoined while neshama has its abode in the character of a man. Oh which place remains unknown and discovered. If a man strive to a pure life, he is therein assisted by holy neshama, through the which he is made pure and saintly and attains to the name of holy. But if he does not strive to be righteous and pure of life, there does not animate him holy neshama, but only the two grades, nefesh and ruah. You know what? Mm. I think according to this, I think... Just my interpretation of this. I think Ruah would be generally more like the breath of life that animates all things. And I think Neshama would be more like the Holy Spirit. Just in this terminology. You know what I mean? Okay. Like the Nefesh would be like my soul, your soul, your Separate, soul. Yeah. Yeah. The Ruah would be like the force that animates life. And then Neshama would be like the Holy Spirit, the super soul, like the God soul. I don't know. I mean. Yeah. Ruah could. It almost sounds like the breath of life. Right. Whereas the, what was it? The, the, the neshama. Well, the neshama, what was the third one? Nefesh is the individual. Oh, neshama. Yeah. Neshama. That's more like the creative soul, like the the intuition, you know, the the consciousness. Right. Like one of them is like breathing life and animating living things. The other is giving them consciousness and like critical thinking and intuition and stuff like that. Maybe that's what it's saying. I don't know. So it says, he who enters into impurity is led further into it, and he who is and, and he is deprived of heavenly aid. Thus, each has moved forward upon the way that which he, the way which he takes. I thought that was extremely important because it's like the concept here is that if you are just trying to be a better person, if you're trying to be good, the spirit of God will assist you. Mm. If you're not trying mm. to be good, if you're not trying to be pure, righteous, I think that changes, you know. It's like I the mean, will. Like. Yeah, if you if you don't have the intention to better yourself and to seek a better life of compassion, then you won't be assisted by God. Mm. Why, mm-hmm. why would the higher powers want to help you if you don't want to try? But right, it's like, yeah. if you want to try, then yes, the spirit will help you. I find that extremely fucking interesting because in theosophy, they said the same exact thing. It's the will. It, yeah. It's your desire to be good that matters. Yes, exactly. It's like, again, it's not about being perfect. It's not about being Christ or Buddha. It's about having... It's about trying. The desire to be like them. Yeah. It's yeah. about... It's about 
It's like manifestation. It's the intention. Yeah. I want to be like that. Mm -hmm. I want to be better. Okay. Well, that's step one. You're, you're on the path. Yes. Yes. You know? Exactly. You're, you're on the path of initiation. It's like manifestation or like the law of attraction. Like, yeah. you know, you put out there what you want, the universe will give it to you. No one will be perfect. Right. But how can you ever get there if you don't even want to? Yes. But when you want to, yes. the spirit will come down and it's like, let's light this shit up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? The study of these three grades of the soul yields an understanding of the higher wisdom, and it is in such fashion that wisdom alone affords the linking together of a number of mysteries. It is nefesh, the lowest stirring t to which the body adheres, just mm. as in a candle flame. The obscure light at the bottom adheres close to the wick, without which it cannot be. It needs some sort of material. The nefesh, remember, it's our individual soul. The nefesh needs the material. The material, the, the body. body. Yes. yes. When fully kindled, it becomes a throne for the white light above it. And then when these two come into their full glow, the white light becomes a throne for a light not wholly discernible. Uh. An unknowable essence reposing on the white light. And so in all, there comes to be a perfect light. It is the same with the man that arrives at perfection and is named holy as the verse says. Yeah, I was just about to say this is like someone reaching enlightenment. Yeah. Wow. It's all about awakening to the light. Wow. To the light. Whoa, that's crazy. It's like three. I used to think this was evil. Like, oh, Kabbalah? That's. I don't right, want Right, right. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. Dude, that is blowing my mind. I mean, that's literally talking about striving to be better, striving to let go of the material ego. And then in doing that, you are creating a throne for a new flame to arise within you. It's like your per it's like your ego truly dies and is replaced by something else. A pure that flame. is someone who reaches true enlightenment. Yeah, that's crazy. So check this out. Sitting one day at the gate of Lydda, Rabbi Abba saw a man approach and seat himself on a ledge which jutted out over the hollow ground far beneath. The man was weary with travel and fell asleep. Rabbi Abba beheld a serpent crawling toward the man, and it had almost reached him when a branch hurtled from a tree and killed it. Now the man awakened, and seeing the serpent before him, he jumped up. At this instant, the ledge collapsed and crashed into the hollow below. Rabbi Abba approached the man who was sleeping and said, Tell me, why has God seen fit to perform two miracles for you? What have you done? The man answered, whosoever wronged me at any time, always I made peace with him and forgave him. And if I failed to effect peace with him, then I refrained from going to take my rest before I forgave him and along with him forgave any others who had vexed me. At no time did I brood on the injury the man had done to me. Rather, I made special efforts of kindness from then on to such a man at this Rabbi Abba wept and said, this man surpasses even Joseph in his deeds that Joseph should have been forbearing toward this brethren and shown them compassion was only natural, but this man has done more and it is meet that the Holy One, be blessed, <laughs> work successive miracles for him. So I think the 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 mystery hidden within this allegory is, is like we talk about Christ consciousness all the time. It's like the kinder and more loving and 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 Christ-like, I say I say Christ-like. I know that Christ is not in these texts; it's not right, a Christian right. text. But right. I I just think, I just think the example is you know, be be like that, and and be compassionate. And, like, and, yeah, and it's like the the mysterious forces of the universe will back you up. Well, they'll help you more. They'll back you up. The kinder you are, the more merciful, the more loving, the more free spirited and 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 selfless and just unconditional love the more the more you are like a white light mm. the more the forces of the universe will have your back and god will help you mm. you know that makes me think about you know like the old like when video games were becoming open world but they weren't quite open world mm -hmm. so <laughs> it was like if you went along with the missions and the storyline everything was easy Right. Oh, like the right. The world was like, yes, this is what you're supposed to do. You're on the path. But when you fought against it and tried to go into this like semi open world, you were having <laughs> such a hard time. You get wrecked. That's what make that's what it makes me think of. It's like when you're going along with all of the energies and the synchronicities and, and the way it's supposed to be, it's easy. Row and, and doors row, keep opening. Row your boat. But when you fight it, when you swim against the current, yep. it, everything that is God makes it harder. 
gently down the stream, dude. Just flow with it. I'm going to get through just a little bit more here. Um, let's see. The Ten Sephiroth. Okay, here we go. Here we go. This is the Ten Sephiroth as written about in the Zohar, the Book of Radiance. Don't mess with the Zohar. Right. <laughs> but but he's referencing this. Right, That's right, the crazy right. part. Yeah. You know, we grew up watching Don't Mess With the Zohar, and it's like... Well, it's called Zohan. Oh, Zohan. Yeah. Man, you got me, bro. I remembered it as Zohar. You tricked me. I tricked you. I saw that movie like almost 20 years ago. Like when it came out. Yeah. You know, I, couldn't, yeah. I couldn't remember. Yeah, I guess it is Zohan. Yeah, it's Zohan. It? Dang. <laughs> he like disassembles a pistol in like half a second. Like that, that movie's insane. Bro, the funniest part is uh the, the Cage of Puppies. Oh, when my he's God. he's going to blow them up. Because <laughs> I'm going to blow up you. And these puppies. Yeah, that movie's <laughs> unhinged, bro. It is. So, okay, so check this out. I'm skipping forward a little bit on the, the part of the Ten Sephiroth. However, let me go back one little phrase here. Okay. Give me one second. I highlighted a little bit forward. I might need to go back a little bit just so this will make sense. Um, we about to describe the ten different realities that are on the Tree of Life. Basically? Basically. Okay. Very basically. But when he had created the shape of supernal man, it was to him for a chariot, and on it he descended to be known by the appellation Yahweh, so as to be apprehended by his attributes, and in each particular one to be perceived. Hence it was he caused himself to be named El, Elohim, Shaddai, Zevaot, and Yahweh, of which each was a symbol among men of his several divine attributes, making manifest that the world is upheld by mercy and justice in accordance with man's deeds. If the radiance of the glory of the Holy one be blessed <laughs> had not been shed over his entire creation. How could even the wise have apprehended him? He would have continued to be unknowable and the words could not be verily said. The whole earth is full of his glory. However, woe to the man who should make bold to identify the Lord with any single attribute even if it be his own and the less so any human form existent whose foundation is in the dust and whose creatures are frail, soon gone, soon lost to mind. Man dares project one sole conception of the Holy one. Be blessed that of his sovereignty over some one attribute or over the creation in its entirety. But if he be not seen under these manifestations, then there is neither attribute nor likeness nor form in him as the very sea whose waters lack form and solidity in themselves, having these only when they are spread over the vessel of the earth. From this we may reckon it so. One is the source of the sea. A current comes forth from it, making a revolution, which is Yod. Okay, th this, this is the part where it's describing the realities. Okay. So let me, let me read you that. From this may, we may reckon it so. One is the source of the sea. A current comes forth from it, making a revolution, which is Yod. That's the Y in the Tetragrammaton, the Yahweh. Mm. You know, it's like yes. Y, V, H, W, or whatever the order is. Yeah. Okay. The source is one, and the current makes two. Then is formed the vast basin known as the sea, which is like a channel dug into the earth, and it is filled by the waters issuing from the source, and the sea is the third thing. This vast basin is divided up into seven channels, resembling that number of long tubes, and the waters go from the sea into seven channels. Together, the source, the current, the sea, and the seven channels make the number ten. Like the ten sephiroth. Mm. If the creator who made these tubes should choose to break them, then would the waters return to their source and only broken vessels would remain dry without water. And the same wise has the cause of causes derived the ten aspects of his being, which are known as sephiroth and named the crown, the source, which is a never to be exhausted fountain of light, wherefrom he designates himself Ein Sof, the infinite. Neither shape nor form has he, and no vessel exists to contain him, nor any means to apprehend him. This is referred to in the words, Refrain from searching after the things that are too hard for thee, and refrain from seeking for the thing which is hidden from thee. Then he shaped a vessel diminutive as the letter Yod, and filled it from him, and called it Wisdom Gushing Fountain. And he called himself wise on its account. And after he fashioned a large vessel named C, and designated it Understanding, the Bina. These are all the different names of the Sephiroth. The Bina, the Chakma, 
the Ein Sof, etc., etc. Both wise and understanding is he in his own essence, whereas wisdom in itself cannot claim that title, but only through him who is wise and has made it full from his fountain. And so understanding in itself cannot claim that title, but only through him who filled it from his own essence and would be rendered into an aridity if he were to go from it. In this regard, it is written, as the waters fell from the sea and the rivers drained dry. Mm. So two things here. First off, the first part of this excerpt that I read was like, basically like, Shame on you if you try to describe God. If, if you even think you can get close to describing a single yeah. aspect of God yeah. is basically what it like, was. Like, shame on you. Yeah. Yeah, you're a fool. You're <laughs> not going to understand it. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's even a commandment. Don't make a graven image. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. It's pointless. Yeah. And he even like, likened God to like the formless and shapelessness of the ocean. Like, yeah. y- you know what I mean? But then he said uh, 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 an, an, an inex- a never-to-be-exhausted fountain of light. Right. Right, the Ein Sof, the infinite. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. crazy. Yeah, I think I'm approaching the end here, um, which which is great. Okay, the destiny of the soul. Mm. Um, this might be the part that references reincarnation. Ooh. Um, I'm not sure if I took note of that, but I can explain that. Okay. There's a part that talks about the migration of the soul, which or the trans migration of the soul, uh-huh. which is like, okay, it's left this body and now it's in another one, mm. you know? So this is the destiny of the soul. At the time that the Holy One, be blessed, was about to create the world, he decided to fashion all the souls which would in due course be dealt out to the children of men, and each soul was formed into the exact outline of the body she was destined to tenant. See? She. She. The soul. She. Mm. Yeah. Scrutinizing each, he saw that among them some would fall into evil ways in the world. Each one in its due time, the Holy One, be blessed bade come to him and then said go now descend into this and in this place and into this and this body yet often enough the soul would reply lord of the world i am content to remain in this realm i have no wish to depart to some other where i shall be enthralled them and come stained (laughs) wait excuse me (laughs) i just thought that was funny excuse me where (laughs) uh, Where, (laughs) where upon the holy one be blessed. We be <laughs> <laughs> it's every time. Yeah, every time. Would reply. Be blessed. Thy destiny is, and has been the day of thy forming, from the day of thy forming, to go into that world. So we're talking about like, when souls were formed before material reality existed. It was Einstein, always. The infinite was like, I made this whole fucking thing just for you to go there to go into the world so to you, learn yeah you gotta go to, you, yeah. the, you you gotta go there and, That's the and, point. and our souls are like i don't want to we're gonna suffer i don't want to go there and god's like no no that's that's why i that's made you the point that's to, the whole point to go there yeah then the soul realizing it could not disobey would unwillingly descend and come into this world <laughs> the torah council of the entire world saw this and cried to mankind, Behold, see how the Holy One, be blessed, takes pity on you. Without cost, he has sent to you his costly pearl that you may use it in this world, and it is the Holy Soul. And if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant, Exodus 21, 7, I guess about 5,000 years ago, they sold their daughters to be servants. That is, when the Holy One, be blessed, gives over to you his daughter, the Holy Soul for your maiden servant, to be held in bondage by you, I adjure you in her time. She shall not go out as the men servants do. That is stained with sin, but in freedom and light and purity so that her master may rejoice in her and in rewarding her exceedingly with the glories of paradise as it stands written. And the Lord will dot, dot, dot satisfy thy soul with brightness. (laughs) 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 That, That is when she shall have ascended back to that sphere. Bright and pure. Remember the sephirots are spheres. The spheres are the, the sephirots. Spheres. Right. Yeah. So. So it's basically saying like treat the soul with like kindness, goodness. Like if you're gonna, if the soul is gonna incarnate into a body, it's your responsibility to treat it right. Yeah. That's cool. Exactly. Yeah. And to be like, I mean, again, the, the, it's anachronistic to say Christ. Like they're, they're they're not referencing Christ here, but I, I just think. But same same. I, yeah, I think saying. Christ consciousness, you could say rainbow body, mm-hmm. you could say Buddha, Buddha I, I, don't, I don't care. It's just the concept of being pure to others, being being kind, being humble, you know? But um, 
Ta- talks a little bit more about the nature of the soul. Uh, the names and grades of the soul of man are three. Nefesh, the vital soul. Ruah, the spirit. And Neshama, the innermost soul, the super soul. The three are comprehended one within the other, but each has its separate abode. While the body in the grave is decomposing and moldering to dust, Nefesh tarries with it, and it hovers about in this world, going here and there among the living, wanting to know their sorrows, mm. and interceding for them at their need. There's another passage I skipped earlier. I actually skipped a few of these passages, and it talked about uh, when you die, you're greeted by all your loved ones and your ancestors and your family and friends, and they help you to the next world. Wow. It was, it was written here. Um, Ruah betakes itself into the earthly garden of Eden. There, the spirit, desiring to enjoy the pleasures of the magnificent garden, vests itself in a garment, as it were, of a likeness, a semblance of the body in which it had its abode in this world. On Sabbaths, new moons, and festival days, it ascends up to the supernal sphere, regaling itself with the delights there, and then it goes back to the garden, as it is written, and the spirit, Ruah, returneth unto God who gave it. That is, at the special holidays and times we have mentioned. Halloween, bro. Spirits traveling through the portal. The veil, I mean, there's yeah. more references here of Sabbaths, new moons. That's a moon cycle, and festival days, which are you know the star alignments for the holidays, the mm-hmm. equinoxes and the solstices. Again, it's just more evidence here that we're onto something. That that there really is some sort of spiritual energy at yeah. these times, and they believe that the souls travel they're, between they're, realms at these yeah. times. You know, Jeez. Um, but Neshama ascends forthwith to her place mm. in the domain from which she emanated and it is on her account that the light is lit to shine above so heavy emphasis on the soul or the spirit being feminine and light yeah 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 again it's like male and female like or more so uh masculine and feminine yeah but 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 physical and spirit Oh, right, or or right. or light and dark. I mean, it's yin yang. It's mm-hmm. it's dual, right? Yep. When they say male and female, that's what they're that's what they mean. Mm. It's the duality. It's the nature that we are God and man. We are divine and material. We, yeah. you 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 see what I'm saying? I I just think that's very interesting that they reference the spirit as she. Oh yeah, me too. Um, I mean, I've never heard that before. And until such time as Neshama has ascended to be joined with the throne, Ruah is enabled to be crowned in the lower garden, and Nefesh could not rest easy in its place. But, but these find rest when she ascends. That gets me every time. Now, when the children of men, being troubled and sorrowful, betake themselves to the graves of those who are gone, the Nefesh is wakened, and it goes out to bestir Ruah, which then rouses the patriarchs, and after Neshama, whereupon the Holy One, be blessed, has pity on the world. But if Neshama has for some reason been prevented from ascending to her proper place, then Ruah, coming to the gate of the Garden of Eden, finds it closed against it and unable to enter, wanders out alone and dejected, while Nefesh too flits from place to place in the world and seeing the body in which it was once tenant eaten by worms and undergoing the judgment of the grave. It mourns for it, as the scripture says, but his flesh grieveth for him and his soul mourneth over him. So do they all undergo suffering until the time when Neshama is able, enabled to reach her proper place above. Then, however, each of the two others become attached to its rightful place. This is why I wrote all this down. This is because all three are one, comprising a unity embraced in a mystical bond. Mm. So what I got from that was the threefold triune aspect of the soul, right? We have the physical soul that's tied to the body in the material realm, and they said... That when you die, your nefesh, your individual soul, you could say your ego, whatever, is it's tied to you here. But then you have the ruah and the neshama, which are like higher spiritual forces that are flowing between the realities. But all three are one. It's like if you look at the mystical, metaphysical body of human consciousness... On the lowest level, we have the physical form. Then as you go through the realities, we have these higher grades of spiritual bodies. Higher right? and higher yeah. and higher. Yeah. Yeah. The emotional body, the the mental body, astral. the light body. Yeah. yeah. The astral, the light body. Uh, or, or, you know, in their terminology, it's like the physical soul, the vital soul. Then you have the spirit. Then you have the super spirit. They're Mm -hmm. saying the same thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's also really interesting because there's a lot of similar thoughts of like you have three voices in your head. Yeah. You you have you have your conscious voice. You have the voice behind that one that kind of is 
is sort of subconscious and like the thoughts sort of just pop into your head. Not necessarily, you don't necessarily know where they're from. It's just kind of like, is that me talking? Is it not? And then there's another one behind both of those that sees it all happening. It's like three, Let me and Casey had a long conversation about that the other day. It's like three layers of consciousness or awareness. Like there are, there are many thought patterns that, that believe that same thing. And to me, that's how I'm interpret, uh, interpreting that. Within this one body, we... We have three layers. Or, right. Or it's, like three one of, it's like one of them is actually bound to this body. The other two are things that we can... They're like streams that we can access. Yeah, yeah. And even potentially manipulate or, or, or not manipulate, but observe. Observe right. is right. the best way to put it. That's, no, it's crazy. It's, uh, it seems to be all across the board. There's some aspect of... The threefold nature of creation. Yeah. You know? All right. This is my, actually my last bit of notes and then, and then we can peace out after this, but this was, remember, it's funny that it accidentally was safe for last, but remember in the very beginning of the episode, I said emphasis on allegory. Yeah. Okay. So this is the allegorical explanation of Jonah. This is important. Okay. Because again, here we are in 2023, you know, it just as good as me, you, you know, you go to any church in the South or 2024. Or, well, well, yeah, I guess when this comes out, it's 2024. Yeah. yeah. We're recording this December 2023, you fucking egghead. But... <laughs> <laughs> you fucking egghead. <laughs> you got the Popeye hat on. Got... No, it's nothing like it. It's nothing like it at all. Um, <laughs> It's important to me, this, this part, yeah. because, you know, we're taught to understand religion, or I say, you know, religion, but really... Christianity. I'm, I'm trying to be nice towards Christianity. I get, I get a lot of hate. Right. Oh, you're anti-Christian. Well, no, no. Christians are anti-Bledsoe. Yeah, and also, you, know? you guys just got to remember, like, that's the religion we grew up with, and we got some trauma associated with it. That's all. It's not... It's We're not saying it's wrong. We're not saying you are wrong for... It, it's, you know, it, it's just... It's just us. You know what I'm saying? It's just my opinion. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I, I just think this is so important because... <laughs> You know, in the last 30 years that I've been alive, I've had a few old timers in my life, you know, tell me how to think and how to believe about this Bible. Yeah. But then here I am like a thousand years ago, this text was written and they're a thousand years closer to when, you know, the original texts were written. Right, right. Yeah. So I feel like the context of their society, you know, as time goes on, we might lose touch and forget more and more about the origin of, of you know, some sort of body of knowledge. I feel like they probably had a closer ear to the ground yes. than we did. Yes. And this guy is telling you, the story of Jonah may be construed as an allegory of the course of a man's life in this world. Jonah descends into the ship. This is parallel to man's soul descending to enter into his body in this world. Why is the soul called Jonah? For the reason that she becomes subject to all manner of vexation when once she enters into partnership with the body. Soul. The soul is she. Thus, a man in this world is as in a ship crossing the vast ocean and like to be broken as it is written so that the ship was like to be broken. And then too, man in this world commits transgressions for he supposes the master to be disregarding the world and his presence able to be eluded. Thereupon the Almighty stirs up a raging storm, that is, the judgment of a man which stands always before the Holy One, be blessed, and relentlessly seeks his punishment. This is... This it is then that strikes at the ship and remembering man's sins seizes him. Then the man is caught in the tempest and illness fells him. But as Jonah was gone down into the innermost parts of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep, though the man thus lies felled, still his soul makes no move to return to his master to return and atone for his sins. Hence the ship master came to him. That is he who is the all around helmsman in the good inclination and said unto him, what meanest thou that thou sleepest? Arise, call upon thy God. This is no time for sleeping. You are about to be taken up to stand trial for all your deeds in the world. Repent of your wrongdoing. Bend your mind to these matters and return to your master. So like, I just find that so deep that we're having like real authentic texts be like, but what if this story wasn't literal? What if it was an allegory about the soul? You know how many people, bro, you know. 
how much have we thought around as a kid and heard conversations about freaking the Jonah whale? And we're told that, you know, a large fish like actually swallowed this dude up. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? But oh, like, yeah. I, I, I like that version. Yeah. That's what I was saying earlier. Like there are these things that stick out in the Bible that you learn about and you're like, believe it. Yeah, it's like, all right, so a snake was talking to this chick and... Got her to eat an apple. An apple? <laughs> and cursed us. Okay, for... Okay, that's cool. It's like, all right, that guy killed a giant with a slingshot. Okay, all right. There's burning wheels in the sky. It's like, you know, there. It's a lot of it's like normal, seems normal, straightforward, and then you get hit with some weird stuff and you're told to take it literally. And it's like you, your intuition always tells you like that obviously didn't really happen. So what are they actually trying to tell me? And that's what Kabbalah is doing. It's it's tr it's seeking to understand the allegory. Right. Which is so amazing. I mean, I love that. I think that's sick. I will say that the the wheels within the wheels was the orbs. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But the fish, you know, swallowing the dude like. Or Come on. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I do think that a lot of these stories in the Bible are allegorical. And, like, it's not hard to believe. When you understand the history of how the Bible was fashioned, that's what we should do, bro. Mm -hmm. We should honestly, like, I would love to sit down and, like, go through the actual history of this. And I, we, we could do an entire episode just detailing how the Bible was even printed. And it, it's it's really eye-opening, you know? That would and, be And, like, when you know so the history fun. of when these texts were, like, actually written, you know, like, I grew up learning that, Abraham wrote Genesis, you know, 5,000 plus years ago. But, you know, you ask any scholar, anybody who's like a part of this field who actually studies these manuscripts and stuff, they're going to tell you those those oldest biblical texts were written at only around the 600s BC Yeah. by a bunch of anonymous, no-name Jewish mystics mm -hmm. who were actually in prison in Babylon. Right. It's like it was not written anywhere near close to like what when we, they claim what yeah like what the what the conventional belief is right there's a giant misconception about these texts i think that a lot of people's minds are very literally latched on to this this body of knowledge in these texts and i think it's like it's it's very damaging to the soul to mm. be like so latched on to something when you don't even truly understand where it comes from the origin well, of it. I, I mean we talked about in the stream of consciousness episode that i was kind of feeling that way about god i was kind of like feeling that like detachment because i was trying to believe it literally and it was damaging it right. was very damaging you know what i'm saying and that actually it, it pulls you further away from the truth yeah yeah, it is damaging. It's like they just said, basically like shame on you for even trying. Yeah. To 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 to, to describe trying to God. pretend that you know something about yeah. what God is. How can we sit here and say the Bible is all of it? Right. We, exactly. We can't, dude, even even as a child. Even as a child, uh I, I, I always thought to myself, like, wait a minute, but what about two thousand years between now and like did, did God and the angels and all these like crazy miracles just kind of like stop happening when you close the Bible and that story's done? Right. And then there's been nothing supernatural, nothing mystical, no God, no angels, none of that. We just were supposed to believe it existed then, but it Not doesn't now. now. And there's no explanation as to why it doesn't. Yeah. 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 But it's like, I don't know, man. I think there's a lot more to the universe than, than, than one, one, book. one book. One yeah, book. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, sure. I don't understand how people can't. Get past that. Yeah. Yeah. It's comfortable. It's, com you know, it's comfortable to be in that one thing and believe that that one thing is the real thing. Right. You know, right. it's just comfortable. It's like, I, you know, you can, you can literally, like you just said, you can close the book. I mean, the, not to mention it's easy. Yeah. 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 For sure. It is. Yeah. It's easy. Exactly. Yeah. It's comfortable. So, yeah, that's Kabbalah. I mean, like, there's so much more to it, too. That's we, pretty Kabbalah, if you ask me. We didn't even... <laughs> I, I'm... Blessed be. <laughs> blessed be. Blessed be. Blessed be. Blessed be. But we didn't even get into, like, the geometry of the Tree of Life. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that, like... Hey, we'll have to do part two in the Mystery Traditions uh, heck yeah. thing. Yeah, we can, we can Series. revisit it later. But, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, Hope you enjoyed. That blessed. was Kabbalah. Yeah. Blessed be. Blessed be. <laughs> blessed be. And bye, guys. Blessed be. Bye, guys. <laughs>
Thank you so much for watching. If you want to see more, check out our other videos. And before you go, don't forget to subscribe. See you next week. Peace. Peace.